Okay, so uh, thanks a lot, Buddha, and thanks for the invitation for this opportunity to present some of our work in this in this uh, program. Uh, <clears throat> so actually, I'll begin uh, with uh, telling you about who are the people involved in this work. The pictures you see three pictures. There's uh, all postdocs. Where postdocs? Uh, Deshpreet is now taking up a job. Uh, with, uh, Porno is still a postdoc at the University of Chicago. Shuman is currently a postdoc at the ICTS. So these people actually did most of the work, and uh, I also have uh, uh, collaborated with several colleagues: uh, Pinaki, Madan Rao, Bulbul, Sadoj, and uh, Neil. <coughs> so today I want to tell you about uh, some work that uh, we have been doing. Uh, mostly in Bangalore, uh, on uh, glossy dynamics and jamming in active matter. So, of course, I mean, this audience, uh, there is no need to actually give an introduction to active matter. All of you know what it is. So I will not uh, spend any time on, on that. I will have a couple of slides on uh, uh, basically glossy dynamics and jamming uh, that will illustrate what kind of questions we are interested in. So again, you know, these are very well known, but so I'll, I'll sort of go through this very quickly. Uh, basically, what we are looking at, or what we'll be interested in, is uh, glossy behavior and jamming, and uh, what kind of behavior that's uh, coming in the next couple of slides. Uh, this is a standard slide on uh, glass transition and supercool liquids. One is starting with a liquid at high temperature and then quickly cooling it so that it doesn't uh, go into a crystalline state, and then one goes into a supercool liquid, eventually at still what temperatures, supercool liquid basically. Uh, goes into some kind of a amorphous uh, solid state, which is a glass. And uh, we are interested mostly in the dynamics in the supercool liquid, as well as uh, you know, what's the property of these this glassy states that uh, one gets at uh, still lower temperatures. <clears throat> as you all know, the main issue here is the dynamics uh, in the supercool liquid state. And uh, I have shown you know, why it is interesting. It's because uh, dynamics becomes very, very slow as one approaches the glass transition. And in particular, if you look at the viscosity or appropriate some kind of time scale, it increases by like 12 or 16, 13 orders of magnitude over a temperature range, which is which is quite small. And uh, the way the viscosity depends on temperature uh, also depends on which system you're looking at. And uh, typically one looks at uh, two classes of systems uh, where <coughs> this is the so-called strong systems where the dependence of the viscosity on temperature is, uh, is given by some kind of an Arrhenius law. Uh, whereas uh, for many other systems, uh, this plot is not a straight line. The plot of log viscosity divided by as a function of 1 over t is not a straight line. So it's not Arrhenius. It's faster than Arrhenius. And those uh, systems are called fragile. And uh, the ones that I'll be interested in are essentially this uh, fragile liquid. Uh, <clears throat> and how, why, for example, the main question, one of the main questions is why is it that uh, one sees this uh, non Arrhenius behavior? <coughs> And uh, one more thing I wanted to say, this was basically how we uh, describe this, this uh, growth of the relaxation time uh, in fragile liquids. And a form that is very popular is called the vogel kulcher tamann form, uh, which actually predicts a divergence of the viscosity or the time scale at a finite temperature, which is called T sub VFT. Uh, and uh, when in the subsequent uh, slides, when we talk about glass transition, uh, you will see uh, some some numbers quoted uh, obtained from simulations, and those numbers typically are obtained by fitting the data to this particular form, which gives you a temperature at which uh, we, uh, supposedly the viscosity would actually die, and that temperature will cause the glass transition. <clears throat> there is also fragility and so on, which I'll not go into. Uh, also, just a slide on. Uh, Just a slide on uh, uh, jamming. Uh, the last uh, couple of slides that I showed where the control parameter was the temperature. One is starting with a liquid at high temperatures, and then one is reducing the temperature so that it becomes a super cool liquid and eventually a glass. Here, we'll be looking at uh, systems which are athermal, where thermal fluctuations don't play any important role. Uh, the variable that one uses uh, in this context, typically, is uh, this density. Uh, and uh, at high densities, the system is in a jam state where the particles don't have any degree of freedom to move. Whereas uh, at uh, lower densities, one has uh, some kind of a, a liquid-like state where the uh, degree of 
but the degree of freedom for the particles to move around is, is still there. So as one increases the density, one goes from this kind of a behavior to that kind of behavior. The famous picture uh, jamming phase diagram that was uh, uh, <coughs> proposed by Liu and Nagel many years ago. And uh, subsequently, a lot of work has been done here. So I mean, in glass, we are typically talking about this train where we have the temperature as a variable. And uh, uh, with jamming, we are talking about this train where the temperature has been set equal to zero, but we are looking at the behavior as a function of the density. And uh, people have found that there are many interesting things going on near the threshold where one goes from this kind of behavior to that kind of behavior. Uh, and there are power laws and marginality and so on and so forth. So when you talk about uh, active jamming, we'll try to sort of understand or figure out whether the jam state that one gets in active systems also has similar property as what we have for the passive systems. <laughs> so these are the basic questions. Uh, why are we interested in these questions? Uh, because uh, uh, this kind of behavior in active systems has been observed in many experimental situations. And I've just given you a few examples. Uh, <coughs> bacterial cytoplasm, uh, cytoskeleton, uh, cytoskeleton motor uh, complexes. And in particular, there are a huge number of experiments on layers of epithelial cells where one sees this kind of behavior just as you change the activity or some other parameter like the packing fraction, then there is a change in the behavior gone from unjammed to jammed state or vice versa, things like that. Uh, and uh, this kind of experiments have been done in a wide variety of uh, systems, and I have just given you the names of a uh, few of them. And uh, this classy behavior also has been observed in, uh, or jamming both of these actually have observed in uh, experiments on sort of synthetic active matter, which are not uh, living objects. All these things are, because the activity essentially comes because these are living objects, but here uh, one has uh, genus colloids and granular material, not living, but uh, they can be modeled as uh, active systems. And one is looking at uh, this kind of behavior in those systems. <laughs> so just uh, one or two examples. I don't want to give you, there are many such examples. Uh, here there is a movie where one is looking at uh, a cell monolayer and uh, the function of time. So initially the cells were moving around, that was sort of like a fluid state, but eventually as you go to longer times, the motion goes away and one gets into a jam state. So let's see, it's not playing very well. So now it is a liquid, it's moving around, but uh, the function of time, which is on the left-hand side, left -hand top left corner, you will see that uh, this motion will eventually die out and uh, one would get some kind of a jam state, amorphous jam state. And the uh, explanation is that uh, this is happening because the uh, increase of cell-cell addition, that the, uh, the two cells sticking to each other, that uh, addition force increases as a function of time because of some biophysical reasons, and that's why the system gets jammed. <clears throat> One more uh, example I just want to tell you about because I found it quite impressive. It's a very recent uh, paper uh, where uh, one is looking at uh, tumors, cancer cells, and one finds that uh, there is some kind of an unjamming of certain kind of cells in a tumor. Uh, this is illustrated here that you have this uh, cells which are not moving at all or very little, whereas some other cells are moving over large distances. So this is uh, uh, jammed region and this is the motile region. And uh, the properties of this motile cells apparently is very important in predicting whether the cancer will metastasize or not. So metastasis is of course when the cancer cells move from one tumor to some other parts of the body and this is what makes it very, very difficult to treat. And uh, in this paper they say that uh, this predictability of whether a particular uh, cancer will metastasize or not uh, can be improved a great deal if one looks at uh, the properties of these uh, mobile cells and how the jammed to mobile transition occurs in this uh, in this tumors. <clears throat> anyway, so you know there are many other examples. So, but uh, of course, I mean the models that we'll be looking at are not actual cancer cells or epithelial cells, which are uh, models will be much simpler versions of this, in which uh, some basic things about uh, active prop active particles uh, will try to incorporate. <clears throat> So this is the basic model that we'll be looking at. 
So uh, here is a cartoon. Uh, we see two kinds of, we'll, we'll be looking at spherical particles, point particles with Leonard Jones kind of interaction. We'll be looking at dense uh, uh, systems where uh, uh, particles are close to each other. And typically we'll be looking at a mixture of two or more kinds of particles, because if you don't do that, if you have a single kind of particle, then uh, uh, this system easily crystallizes. Whereas what we want to study is the supercooled liquid and eventually the glass. So, and that can be obtained in, in, in model systems by uh, having some kind of a binary mixture. And what binary mixture I'll tell you in, in a minute. Uh, so that part is, is something that you know, people who study glasses, they have basically looked at that uh, over the years, that what kind of systems are good glass formers and what kind of systems are not so good glass formers and so on. So that we take from that literature. Uh, and now we introduce this additional thing, uh, activity. And uh, this activity, uh, these are schematically represented by these arrows, which represent active forces. So in addition to the interparticle forces, there is also an active force that uh, is there in the model. And this active force is specified by two parameters in our case. One is the typical magnitude of the active force. And the active force doesn't remain always pointing in the same direction. So there is a time scale associated with uh, uh, how this direction is changing. And that time scale is called persistence time. Again, these are all familiar to all of you here. So in addition to the sort of variables like uh, density, uh, composition, et cetera, that one uh, has in the study of ordinary glass systems, we now have these two other variables. One is uh, the strength of the activity and the other is uh, the persistence time. And in, in this talk today, particularly, I will be interested in the behavior when the persistence time is quite long. Uh, so that is why uh, we call it persistent active matter. The model is actually something which is very familiar to people who work on glasses. Uh, we uh, deal with two-dimensional systems. So it's a two-component system, a 65-35 mixture, and the interactions are Leonard Jones. And the Leonard Jones potentials are chosen in such a way that the system doesn't crystallize so easily. And this was done by uh, what I call uh, many, many years ago, and this uh, model is called the Cobb Anderson model, uh, which is very well known in the study of uh, glassy systems. So we look at that, and uh, then we introduce on top of that, uh, interactions are given, density is given. And uh, here we are looking at a thermal system. Uh, thermal fluctuations are not there. Uh, so that other things that we need are uh, things that characterize the activity. And as I said, there will be two such parameters. One is this active force, the other is this tau p. Uh, one is the strength of the force, the other is how persistent these this forces are. So the equation of motion is a Langevin equation. We, uh, it's not uh, overdamped. We, we keep a mass term. Uh, this is friction term. And this is the interparticle forces, which are given by uh, this Leonard Jones interactions. And this is the active force. Active force is the magnitude multiplied by unit vector. You need vector in two dimensions as an angle theta, and the theta itself has these dynamics, so that uh, the, uh, uh, this, this time scale uh, it tells you about how long a theta more or less remains in the same direction. Time scale associated with reorientation of this force. Yes. Just to clarify, by a thermal unit, it does not repeat rotation. Uh, it's still rotation. So I just, I mean, no, no. So I mean, in our human equation, I could also put in some kind of a thermal noise. Yeah, no, so that, huh. but, but it's still got the rotation. Uh, these are point particles. So uh, the force direction changes. If we call that uh, rotational diffusion, yes, that is present. <coughs> but uh, there is no uh, usual thermal noise. And the issue, point is that, you know, if you had uh, this system without the active force, since the density is very large, system will be stuck. It will be in the glass state. So the question is now, if you introduce the active force, then uh, does it thermal fluidize the system and, and then what happens? Okay, so this is uh, the model. I mean, anybody have any other question about the model? So we have uh, looked at this uh, model over uh, uh, at least a couple of years, or maybe a little more than that. Uh, I will not go into all the things that we have uh, found out, but this is a summary of the uh, main results uh, that this model uh, gives us, behaves. 
uh, as a function of now, I mean, density has been fixed, the composition has been fixed. So the two period para parameters that we vary, one is the force and the other is the persistence time. And one can look at some kind of a phase diagram in this two-dimensional way. And uh, this was first reported, yeah, more than two years ago in, the, in this paper. Uh, so here we see many uh, phases, different color. Color is actually representation of the relaxation time. Uh, this uh, red, reddish color basically means uh, small relaxation time, and this bluish color means large relaxation. So in this in this two-dimensional plane, there are several regions that one encounters. Uh, first, we talk about uh, the situation where the persistence time is uh, short. In this case, as you change the strength of the active force, as you go to bigger active forces, system goes from some kind of a glassy arrested state to a fluidized state. So this is the, or if you come in this direction, then this is the glass transition. A fluid is basically freezing into some kind of an amorphous state, uh, which is uh, which we'll call a glass. So, and uh, this, this points are basically the uh, transition the points where the transition occurs. And this is obtained by again, fitting things to a VFT and then looking at some kind of a divergence temperature. So you see that as one goes uh, <coughs> this way, as one increases the tau p, there is a particular way in which uh, uh, this thing changes. And uh, then, I mean, I'll, I'll come to the behavior that one sees here and there. Uh, these are the ones that I'll be sort of, uh, talking more about it. And today, because we are talking about persistence uh, active matter, where the persistence time is quite large. Uh, the behavior in this end uh, actually can be understood uh, fairly easily. Uh, there are various theories of that, and I, we have been involved in some of these theories. So behavior for small values of the persistence time can be understood by sort of approximating the active force uh, by some kind of a thermal force, which basically plays the role of temperature. And uh, how to do that is something that, uh, you know, there are many sim very simple ways of doing that. There are more complicated ways of doing that. Uh, the, we have been involved in some calculation in which there is a standard theory of uh, glass transition, uh, random first order transition theory. This we tried to sort of modify to take into account the effects of activity. And uh, the results that we get actually is not uh, very different from uh, the one that we would get if we are just using this effective temperature approximation. Uh, and uh, the line that we draw here is basically the prediction of the theory. So at least you know some ex uh, some of the numerical results as to how uh, activity affects the glassy phase and how it sort of fluidizes the glassy phase uh, can be uh, understood in the limit of uh, small relaxation time uh, using this kind of. Mm, effective temperature approximation, or if you want to be a little more sophisticated, then one can use this RF-40 theory. And there are a couple of papers, uh, one published recently, where we compare the prediction of this with uh, what one finds in the Michael simulations, and uh, one finds reasonably good agreement. <clears throat> but you know, here, there, the main issue is just uh, how this uh, uh, glassy state that you get for uh, zero or small values of activity how that fluidizes as we increase the activity. Uh, so that part is uh, given by this formula, which uh, provides a good uh, representation of experimental results. But now, uh, again, you know, going back to this uh, phase diagram, uh, one is looking at here, where the persistence time is large, but uh, uh, still, of course, finite. And there, one finds uh, something new, which in this uh, picture we call intermittent. And what does this mean? It means that if I now look at the time history of the system, then what we'll find is that uh, uh, in this region, the system sort of goes back and forth between a jam state and a fluidized state. So here we are plotting the kinetic energy as a function of time. And uh, in this case, for example, where you see this big uh, fluctuation, uh, this corresponds to uh, usual liquid, but then in between that, we'll have this region where the uh, kinetic energy is essentially equal to zero. That basically means that it has not reached a true jam state. If it reaches a true jam state, then it would stay there. Well, I mean, here, uh, the true jam state actually is not possible because you have a, a force which has a persistence time. So the force keeps on changing. So if for a particular realization of the forces, things look jammed, 
later time when the forces are different, then the system will not be jammed, but nearly jammed state. And uh, it goes back and forth between these two. And uh, of course, the time it spends in the jam state and the time it spends in the liquid state changes as we uh, as we change the uh, the strength of the active force, and eventually uh, it goes into the dynamic elasticity. So this kind of intermittent behavior that uh, uh, many other people also have found. I mean, I, uh, the next there are references where uh, also in numerical simulations, they have found this intermittent behavior. Uh, what uh, I just want to point out without going into too many details is that recently in, uh, in the lab of uh, Rajesh, Rajesh Karapati, uh, they have also found this intermittency in an uh, experiment where they're looking at uh, uh, <coughs> granular active ellipsoids and uh, they're, they're changing the, the, the packing fraction. Uh, <clears throat> volume fraction, and uh, then you know the time scale increases, and then one gets into something that looks like a, a glass. But, <clears throat> and there, in this region, just one, as one of this here, uh, one finds this kind of time history that the system is uh, here. One is looking at the displacement, not the kinetic energy. So there are some uh, intervals during which there is substantial displacement. Those are like liquid, whereas uh, the other intervals, uh, the particles appear to be frozen. So this kind of intermittent behavior. Uh, has been observed in this experiments on this synthetic active matter. So the intervals, the length of this time intervals. Uh, <clears throat> we looked at that, these people also looked at that. So there is some experimental data or uh, simulation data, but there is no good theory as far as I know, which actually gives you What's exactly plotted on the y-axis? What's B, B So they basically look at uh, this. I mean, you know, so they can image this 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 grains, and uh, they look at the displacement over a certain period of time. So if I have a if I have a passive signal that I look at the same quantity, there's dynamic energy in it. Does it look yeah. very different to this? Uh, you can say that this is extreme uh, dynamical heterogeneity as a function of time. Now, I mean, in dynamical heterogeneity, when you look at passive liquids. You will look at different parts of a space, and in one space uh, things will look fast in one one part, some other part things will look slow. And if you look at a particular area, then again, as a function of time, uh, it can change from fast to slow and the other way around. So yeah, similar things will be seen in dynamic heterogeneity in a passive liquid also. But uh, here, uh, the interesting thing is that the motion actually. It looks like you know nothing is happening, and then suddenly some uh, uh, plastic event happens, and that takes the system away from this stuck state, and then it behaves like a liquid, and then again, one goes through this back and forth. Yeah, and this is the whole system, not you know one 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 part of the system. <clears throat> So today, actually, what uh, I'm going to spend uh, the remaining, I don't know how much time, 20 minutes, so half an hour, a lot of time on, is uh, some kind of a strange limit, uh, which is uh, infinite persistence time. So what is happening here is that uh, you have, you're assigning this uh, ran random uh, uh, active forces to the particles initially, and they are all chosen to be in different directions. Uh, randomly. But once you have chosen the direction of the force on a particular particle, that doesn't change further as a function of time. Whereas if you are doing uh, large persistence time, then if you look at time scales which are long compared to that persistence time, the direction of the force will change substantially. So this is the uh, limit uh, that uh, I'll tell you a little bit about why we consider this limit. But uh, this limit also was considered uh, to some extent in our old paper. And there, you look at this, this uh, point where the persistent time has been set to infinity. Uh, and then uh, one point, some kind of a jamming transition. That if uh, the strength of the force is large, then the system is in a fluid state where the particles are moving around. But as you decrease the strength of this active force, then below a certain value of the active force, system gets into a jam state. 
And once it gets into a jam state, it doesn't uh, uh, have any, you cannot do anything else because now there is no thermal noise and the forces are constant. Forces are not changing as a function of time. So <clears throat> that's uh, some kind of, a, in some sense, you know, uh, absorbing state and uh, uh, the system gets into the state. And uh, of course, I mean, one has to look at uh, how long it takes to get in, into that state and so on and so forth, which I'll come to later on. But uh, you know, what they found is that uh, there is a jamming threshold, and this was also found by these people uh, in another paper. So this is a sort of uh, strange kind of jamming that uh, you have an ethermal system. Of course, in jamming, typically you have ethermal systems. Uh, some interactions are there. Uh, and uh, what you're doing is you're fixing the density. In, in standard jamming, you will change the density that in a low density system will be in a free dial state and high density will be in a jam state. But here, density is fixed. The knob that you're tuning is basically the strength of the active force. And the active force uh, is now characterized by only the magnitude of the force because uh, once we have chosen the direction of the active force for a particle, this is not going to change as a function of time. Okay. So this looks like kind of an artificial system. I mean, one can, uh, I don't know how one can actually realize this uh, uh, infinite persistence time limit in an experiment. Although there are some proposals that I have seen and robots, I guess, small robots and collection of them, then you can do sort of whatever you want. But uh, uh, so the issue is, uh, why uh, is this limit interesting? And this is what I'll be talking about the rest of the talk, that in this limit, we found uh, both uh, the liquid state, liquid state is here when the active force is large, and uh, the jam state uh, uh, to, to have properties which are substantially different from what you, what you see in, in, in standard passive uh, jamming uh, situations. <clears throat> So why are we looking at it? <clears throat> so first of all, I mean, in active matter, if you want to look at jamming, then you have to look at this, this limit. Otherwise, I mean, if the active forces are allowed to change as a function of time, then uh, you will never get a force balance state which persists uh, uh, forever. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the limit that uh, uh, is, uh, has, to be, has, to be, has to be taken if you want to look at jamming in this system. Uh, another interesting reason, and uh, this is something we are doing some work in this in this direction, is that uh, when these forces are constant, when the forces are not changing as a function of time, then one can include the forces in some kind of a Hamiltonian. <clears throat> so, I mean, you know, just looking at the, the, the potential energy, so to speak, there is, of course, the kinetic energy that also has to be put in there. But here, uh, we have the interparticle interaction term, and the forces are represented by uh, this. I mean, this is not a uh, well-posed problem in the sense that, you know, this has this uh, uh, coordinates and it's not bounded and things like that. So one cannot really treat this as a, a Hamiltonian system, uh, particularly also when you have finite system, periodic boundary conditions and things like that, where uh, this Hamiltonian doesn't really work. But uh, if we want to look at a jam state, then this jam state you can identify as minima, local minima of this where the net force on each particle is equal to zero. Net force includes now the forces coming from interactions as well as the uh, active force, which is now uh, constant, doesn't change as a function of time. And then there are other things. There are things like, you know, Hessian calculation, excitations and things like that, that one can study. But uh, it is not absolutely clear how to do those kind of things when you have a force which itself is changing as a function of time. Yeah, so that's what I was saying. The periodic boundary condition, uh, this will no longer work as long as the, I mean, we use periodic boundary conditions. Yeah. Uh, okay. oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, one can also keep track of how many times it has crossed, and so one can unwrap sort of the trajectories. Uh, and then for that, one might say that this will work. But then, you know, as you go to very large values of R, uh, these are all sort of bounded functions. But this keeps on increasing. So energy doesn't have any bounds. So I mean, this is not a well posed problem. That's it. But if you're just looking at a minimum uh, jam state and its immediate vicinity, then uh, one, can, one can use this as some kind of an energy function and look at uh, small excitations, uh, low lying excitations, and things like that. The other motivation was that so here, uh, of course, I mean, you know, now we are looking at infinite persistence time, but uh, uh, 
there are experiments and uh, simulations the limit of large persistence time. So here, for example, when we are looking at this part, here the system is fluid edged. And the persistence time is large. It's not infinity, but it uh, changes only only perhaps a small amount over this this uh, time range. So if I want to understand some properties of this liquid, then uh, this infinite persistence time might be a limit that uh, is useful to understand what is going on uh, when the system is in the liquid state or when it is in the uh, jam state for a long time. So anyway, I mean, you know, these are the sort of motivations, and then uh, I mean, uh, I'll tell you about some of the uh, sort of unusual properties that one sees in this persistent liquid and also in the persistent block or jam state. So uh, first, we'll start with the liquid, large value of F. So even if there is no even if there is no thermal noise, uh, uh, system is in a fluid state coming from uh, this this active forces. As you can see here, particles are moving around and, and so on and so forth. So we look at some properties of this liquid at large values of the active force. Uh, this liquid, as far as the structure of the liquid is concerned, doesn't look very different from a thermal liquid. The structure is expressed by this radial distribution function, which is the probability of finding two particles at a certain distance. And uh, the probability, the, you have this, uh, it's a, a two-component system, so we have two, three kinds of pair distribution functions, A, A, B, B, and A, B. And so we have uh, shown all, all three of them. And uh, some indication of some uh, information about the system size dependence also is, is shown here, because as we'll see, system size dependence will become very important in this, in this particular uh, situation of uh, infinite persistence time. The message here is that uh, this doesn't look very different from ordinary liquid. And also there is some system size dependence, but it is not very strong. So these are the things that are written here, uh, <clears throat> similar to, so as far as just the structure of the liquid is concerned, uh, there's nothing very funny about it. But then uh, if you look at other quantities, then we'll see some things which are very different from ordinary thermal liquid. And one thing that uh, we found very surprising is that uh, you can look at the distribution of the kinetic energy. So each particle, of course, in liquid state is moving around. It has kinetic energy. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one looks at uh, how uh, this kinetic energy per particle, how is it distributed? As the system is going through uh, many configurations uh, in the steady state, then this, this quantity will change. And uh, one finds a non-Gaussian distribution that is not perhaps very surprising. But what one finds is that uh, the whole distribution moves to larger values as one goes to larger systems. So the question is, uh, first of all, I mean, you know, this is not seen in thermal liquids. In thermal liquids, the distribution will converge. If you go to bigger and bigger systems, it will converge to, uh, well, simple case, it will be the natural Boltzmann distribution. Uh, here it is non-Gaussian, it has a tail on the uh, big side, and also the whole distribution uh, shifts to larger values as one goes to bigger and bigger systems. And uh, one can describe this uh, sort of phenomenologically by some kind of dependence on uh, the system size, n is the number of particles. But uh, at this point, uh, I mean, we don't have any theoretical understanding of why the uh, average kinetic energy should have this kind of a dependence on the number of particles that you have in the system. So suggestions about uh, that, <clears throat> how to actually formulate or explain this uh, would, be, would be very, very useful to <clears throat> So there is one situation where we know that uh, strong system size dependence is present. And uh, typically uh, that happens when there is a large length scale in the problem. A uh, common example is uh, uh, near a critical point where uh, causation length diverges, and there one sees strong system size dependence. Uh, whenever there is a large length, the systems which are smaller than or bigger than that length scale will behave differently, and from that we'll see system size dependence. So here also there is a, a indication that uh, there is a length scale which is uh, very large in the system. So what is that length scale? So in the structural situation, in the structural data doesn't show any anything that uh, would lead to a very uh, long length scale. Although I mean, you know, there are many correlation functions that one can look at which we haven't looked at. Uh, 
but we have found something which actually gives you infinite correlation length. So that is the thing that we are going to talk about now. <clears throat> so now we look at the velocities. <clears throat> look at the autocorrelation function of the velocities. So it's a uh, velocity at the same uh, particle at uh, two different times, zero and t, and uh, one is looking at a function of uh, time. And here, again, you know, very different from uh, thermal liquid. Thermal liquid, this autocorrelation function will go to zero at long times. Here, it doesn't go to zero. It goes to a finite value, and the finite value actually increases as one goes to bigger systems. So, uh, oh, a finite value of the autocorrelation function at long times basically means that there is an average velocity. So this finite value is basically the square of the average velocity of each particle. So this says that although things look like uh, ordinary liquid, it is not because uh, uh, each particle is picking up some kind of an average velocity. If there is an average velocity, the displacement, uh, mean square displacement will be, will be uh, uh, ballistic at long times. And that is what we see here also, that is square dependent long time. And what you get from here and what you get, get from there, of course, we'll, we'll agree. So this is uh, one surprise that uh, each particle in this persistent active liquid actually has a non-zero average velocity. Now, if you think about it, uh, it is not all that surprising because uh, uh, persistent basically means that uh, there is a force acting on each particle and this, this force is constant. It is not changing as a function of time. So if we just look at one particle and uh, treat the other particles as some kind of a viscous medium in which this particle is moving, and then you apply a, a constant force to this, then it will have some kind of a terminal velocity at long times. So this is what is happening. Uh, of course, I mean, you know, the one thing that uh, we, have, we are careful about is that the sum of the active forces is always set equal to zero. When we choose the active forces, uh, the sum is set equal to zero. So there is no center of mass motion. Each particle is moving with a constant velocity. Different particles are moving with not constant velocity. The velocity is fluctuating a lot, but the average velocity uh, is, doesn't change as a function of time uh, for each of these particles. And uh, not surprisingly, when we look at the direction of the average velocity and the direction of the active force, it basically falls on a diagonal line. So that each particle is basically picking up a non-zero average velocity in the direction of the persistent active force acting on it. But still the dynamics sort of looks like ordinary, uh, I mean, dynamics doesn't look like ordinary liquid, there are many things, but the structure looks like ordinary liquid. And if you just looked at the uh, picture of uh, movie of how the particles are moving around, perhaps uh, you'd say that it's not all that different from ordinary liquid, but these are certainly very big differences uh, from uh, ordinary thermal liquid. That uh, <clears throat> each particle picks up uh, small average velocity in the direction of the persistent active force that is acting on that particle. And now, we're, so here is still a single particle property. We are looking at the velocity of a particular particle uh, and its time correlation. We are looking at average velocity of a single particle. We are looking at how the direction of that average velocity compared with the direction of the active force which is acting on it. But we have not said anything about how the velocity at one point in space is correlated with the velocity at some other point in space, the spatial correlation function. And there again, uh, one has surprises. So <clears throat> we have looked at uh, different kinds of spatial correlation functions. One is just the velocity, velocity uh, spatial correlation function. One can also look at the active force, active force spatial correlation function, or the velocity active force spatial uh, correlation function. So it's just uh, you know looking at two points in space same time, and you're looking at uh, the particle which are here, how their velocity is correlated with the velocity of, that you see at some other point in space. Uh, and now each particle also has an active force, so one can calculate also the correlation between the velocity and the active force, and the active force, active force correlation. And uh, what we find here is that uh, these correlations are typically very long range. So what we are looking at is uh, different system sizes, for a small system, of course, uh, uh, you know you can look at these correlations only up to a finite uh, distance because we are dealing with finite systems. So it's some L, L over two or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, for small systems, this uh, correlation goes to zero. Actually, it doesn't go to zero first. I mean, you know, it, it becomes slightly negative and then goes to zero. Same thing is true for all of this. And uh, the distance over which this correlation is decaying is basically increasing as one goes to bigger and bigger systems. 
So uh, these pictures say that all of these correlations, they are very similar. And uh, they decay in space very, very slowly. And uh, one can define some kind of a length scale associated with this correlation. And that length scale is increasing as one goes to bigger and bigger systems. So it's similar. I mean, you know, if you, if you had some kind of uh, uh, critical point or something like that, then uh, you will uh, see that uh, uh, strong systems are dependent. And uh, <clears throat> if you have in a phase which is critical, like the 2DXY model, low temperatures, again, you will see very strong systems are dependent. And the length scale will keep on increasing as you go to bigger and bigger systems because there the actual length scale in the thermodynamic limit has become infinite. <clears throat> so this is uh, something that is happening, and uh, this in some sense explains why you know all of these things that we look at, why they are uh, not all of them, but you know, particular dynamical things that we look at, all of them have uh, uh, a strong system size. <clears throat> and how does this length scale actually depend on system size? Yeah. So the correlation length actually, uh, what the limited data range that we have is just proportional to the linear size of the system. The square root of uh, n, number of particles, uh, and uh, all these three correlation lengths, FF, FB, and VV correlation function, uh, all of them have very similar uh, uh, special dependence, and all of them are increasing more or less linearly with uh, uh, the linear size of the system. So this says that uh, this state that we are looking at, this liquid state that we are looking at, is critical in the sense that it has actually a correlation length which would diverge uh, if we had a thermodynamically infinite system. And uh, this, uh, of course, is somewhat surprising, but uh, uh, similar things have been, uh, in some sense, found by other people uh, when this tau p is large. Uh, they have looked at the velocity-velocity correlation, a finite uh, uh, persistence time. And uh, at least, you know, uh, some systems they have found that uh, it increases as one goes to larger and larger values in the persistence time, and there's a square root dependence. So, of course, I mean, according to this, when this tau p goes to infinity, your psi also will uh, divert. Uh, so, this limit, this limit of infinite persistence time, somehow is a singular limit in which uh, one has. Uh, uh, Special correlations over arbitrarily large distances. <clears throat> and the other thing that I found surprising is that uh, this force force correlation itself, that also uh, becomes long range. Now, uh, here, if you think about it, I mean, how do we actually uh, simulate the system? We start with a system, a passive system, uh, and then assign the values of the active forces randomly. So that some of the active forces is equal to zero. Uh, and uh, then allow the system to evolve. If the active force is really strong, uh, the system will come, will will uh, fluidize and will get uh, steady state. Now, initially, when you assign the active forces, then uh, this is done totally at random. So there is no special correlation in this active forces. But as the system uh, basically uh, evolves by itself and in the steady state, it sort of self-organizes into a situation in which uh, particles which have similar directions of the active force, they come uh, close to each other. And that is what is shown by this FF correlation. That initially this correlation uh, would be non-existent because uh, at different points in space, that when the different particles are, we are choosing this active force totally at random. Directions at random. They have the same magnitude, but the directions are at random. But then as a function of time, the system sort of evolves in, uh, towards the steady state. And in the steady state, they get into a self-organized situation where the forces, uh, uh, the particles, which have similar directions of the active force, they come together and they move together. That's why it gives you a large length scale associated with this FF correlation. So this is an example of uh, some kind of self-organization, and the, the mechanism of that is something that is interesting to study, which is something that we are trying to understand. Uh, and this self-organized state actually also is critical in the sense that uh, the length scale over which this organization occurs will diverge in the thermodynamic. So these are some uh, unusual properties of this active liquid. And uh, 
remaining time. Okay, about ten minutes, right? Uh, I'll, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the jamming of this active liquid and also the properties of the jam state. So, are there any questions about this? Uh, yeah. This very large length scale, it's at all different temperatures or persistent times. It's not the one state. Yes, it's not a state point. As you change the F, the strength of the active force, as long as it is large enough. So that you get this liquid state, it's not stuck. There we'll have um, this kind of behavior. So it's not a point, sort of a line. Yeah. Not yet. Okay, so then we move on to. Oh, so there is a picture here, it's not very clear, but you see this twirling uh, motion that uh, this light part is where the velocity magnitude is large. Those are the particles which are moving with large uh, velocity. And if you look at it closely, then you'll see that the directions of the velocities are also more or less aligned. So there's a group, whole group of particles, a very large group of particles, which are moving sort of together. And this changes as you, know, as, you as you go to, 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 to uh, longer times, then uh, the directions and the positions, et cetera, of this, of this uh, source, they, they will change. But uh, the point is that uh, there's a large length scale comparable with to system size associated with this source. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now the next part, which is this jamming. So now we are looking at the dynamics of this process that you start with this liquid state, this uh, strongly correlated liquid that uh, we just described, and then reduce the value of F to a small value in just one step, it's a quench, and then let the system run. And if the value of f is sufficiently small, then it will get stuck into a jam state. If it if is not sufficiently strong, then it will not get stuck. So the question is uh, this dynamics of this jamming process. And here I have a movie that uh, will also illustrate this intermittency that I was talking about earlier. So this is just a, just a snapshot a movie about uh, what the particles are doing. And uh, blue basically means the particles are stationary. Velocity is zero. So you see that it sort of goes to a state which sort of looks like it is stuck, but then something happens and then uh, um, again it goes into some kind of a liquid-like state where particles are moving, but then eventually it gets stuck. So uh, starting from just, uh, you, can, you can look at it once again. So initial state, it is basically kinetic energy is decreasing. Uh, so most particles are getting stuck, but some others are moving. And then uh, it would look like you know, everything is stuck. But then again, you know, this nucleates, uh, this plastic event nucleates at some point in space. And then, and this is shown here. Uh, uh, system temporarily goes into a state where the particles are moving. But then again, eventually it uh, goes to a state where everything appears to be uh, stuck. So this is a jam state. This is a state where the net force on each particle uh, is equal to zero. Uh, so actually we start the, stop the simulation when it becomes like 10 to the minus 12 or whatever. So it's basically a state where all the particles uh, are in a force balanced state. And uh, basically this process is something that we're interested in. But initially you start with a liquid where all the particles are moving. And then if you go to a smaller value of F, then they eventually get stuck. And uh, how does that proceed? <clears throat> This is sort of like, uh, let's say, I mean, if you want to study the uh, formation of a crystal, start with a liquid and then you reduce the temperature and then you study how the uh, solid state at the low temperature, how that develops as a function of time. So <clears throat> this is, uh, again, I don't want to emphasize this, but uh, for a given system size, the time the system takes to reach the uh, jam state that increases as one increases f. And that's also is expected. But uh, there's earlier picture we showed some kind of critical value of f. Beyond that critical value of f, system is supposed to remain in the liquid state. It shouldn't get jammed. But then as you uh, decrease your, your active force below that value, then it uh, gets jammed. But uh, the time it takes to jam and the process of jamming itself uh, now uh, depends on the value of f to which you quench the system. And as you increase that value, then time increases. <clears throat> Uh, 
And uh, this is something that shows uh, what is going on in the system to some extent. Uh, again, I'm plotting the kinetic energy as a function of time. Time is basically measured from the time where the system is quenched to this small value of f. And the kinetic energy initially was some value. Uh, f equals 3 is where uh, we start with. And then uh, as you uh, reduce it to some value of f, uh, the kinetic energy decreases, and eventually it goes to essentially 0. So this is the jamming that we are talking about. And uh, if you look at the different cards, they correspond to different values of the of the f to which you are quenching. So the first one is actually this. This one is where you quench it to f equals zero, quench it to the, uh, the passive limit, and then you gradually increase the value of f. And as you see that uh, this jamming process is becoming slower and slower as you go to larger values of f, and also uh, the behavior of this kinetic energy is becoming more and more complex. And what you find here is that uh, there's the initial part which is not interesting, but then uh, as you go to large values of f, there is this plateau, which seems to extend to larger and larger times as you go to larger and larger values of f. This plateau is not clear when f is very small. And it's a log log plot. So a straight line here is some kind of a power law. And uh, this power law has been seen by people. Uh, for example, uh, this is a reference to a situation, a paper where this power law was studied for the passive system. There you start from uh, the liquid state and point the temperature down to zero, and then see how uh, the kinetic energy or the average velocity uh, change as a function of time. And one sees this power law, which is the same as this kind of power law that we see when the final value of f is very small. But this uh, simple power law changes to something which is much more complicated as one goes to larger value. Now, if you look at this picture, uh, a question that we'll ask is that uh, what would happen for this black curve? The black curve is for a fairly large value of f, and uh, it's sort of kinetic energy is sort of remaining constant. The question is whether it remains constant uh, to arbitrarily long times, or if you actually could do the simulation for a much longer time, it will. Uh, come down, just like in here, the red one, it, it looks constant, but eventually as you go to long enough times, you know, it is going to uh, come down and eventually go to zero. And these are all averages over 1,000 runs or something like that. If you look at a particular run, it will show a much more jagged kind of behavior, and you need a lot of averaging to get this kind of roughly smooth uh, dependence of the kinetic energy on, on time. And uh, so the first question that one asks is that, is there actually truly a, some kind of a threshold such that uh, above the threshold, one would see this, this thing will continue forever. Below the threshold, uh, it will continue for longer time, for longer f, but eventually will come down to zero. And uh, our limited uh, data says that uh, it is difficult to uh, draw any conclusion about that. So what we are uh, plotting here is the jamming time versus f. If it's small, the jamming time is short. And it increases as you uh, as you increase the value of f, and uh, this increase as if it looks like it is going to diverge. So, if it truly followed this line, then one would say that there is a critical value of f such that uh, the jamming time diverges at that point, and that basically means that uh, above that value, system will always remain in the liquid; it will not get into a jam state. But uh, beyond a certain value of f, one finds that you cannot this power law divergence doesn't work anymore. And you get something that looks more like an exponential. And this doesn't diverge. So I mean, this is, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, people who are familiar with uh, glasses, they uh, have seen something like that. Where, uh, for example, there is a crossover from uh, uh, fragile to strong uh, behavior. Fragile behavior would say that the relaxation time apparently diverges at some uh, finite temperature. But then as you go to lower and lower temperatures, the dependence changes. And you get an erroneous uh, dependence, which diverges only at t equals zero. So uh, it's a similar question we are, we are encountering here, that uh, whether uh, there is a true uh, point value of f such that it separates the liquid state and the jam state uh, is not clear. And uh, this is made even more complicated when you look at the system size dependence. And as you can see here, for a fixed value of f, 
as I change n, one sees things similar to what we had talked about earlier. So here again, the same question comes. That if I, this will of course uh, dip, but if I now go to a still larger n, whether that will continue forever or not. So uh, <clears throat> one has to look at uh, the system size dependence of uh, this uh, jamming time much more carefully uh, to be able to predict something about whether there is a critical value, there is a threshold value of this f such that it separates these two uh, regimes. One is that for large f, you'll have uh, liquid, and for small f, you'll have the jams. So <clears throat> this is basically all we have at this point about the jamming. And uh, if uh, I can take two, three minutes, then I'll say a few things about uh, the property of the jam state, which is also somewhat different from uh, passive jam states. Hmm? Yeah, so I'll skip that. There's also some interesting results about uh, MIPS in this infinite persistence time limit. But uh, we have also looked at the property of the jam state, and in particular, uh, the question of whether one has this kind of marginality in the uh, jam state close to the jamming threshold. So that one test of that is basically looking at contact forces and look at its distribution. If it is marginal, then the, there should be some kind of a power law distribution. Uh, that has been verified for passive systems uh, by many, many people. Uh, so what we find here is that, uh, first of all, I mean, there is a strong protocol dependence. How you get the jam state is very important. And depending on that, sometimes you have jam states where uh, each particle has only two neighbors that you don't have in a uh, regular jam state. But here, uh, force balance has force coming from two particles as well as there is an active force which is acting on it. So it is possible to have two rivers. And uh, so these are sort of remnant of uh, this rattlers uh, that you have in, 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 in passive jam states. So we have a protocol to get jam states where there are no particle with just two. Uh, neighbors, because there we see we don't see any 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 scaling behavior at all. Uh, if we if we do that, then there if we look at the contact force distribution, that shows scaling behavior as a function of system size as well as the value of f, the active force. But uh, the scaling function uh, seems to have a gap. So it follows this power law. Uh, this power law here for fairly large values of uh, this this force. But then as you go to smaller and smaller levels of force, it seems to plunge down, doesn't go to, uh, doesn't go all the way to zero. But this is again, you know, as you can see, it's very preliminary data and one has to look at it in bigger systems, sample size dependence and so on and so forth. So there is some indication that uh, if you are looking at this class of jam states where there are no particles with just two neighbors, and then look at uh, uh, the distribution of the contact force near the threshold, jamming threshold, then you see something which is different from what you see in uh, uh, passive jumps. Hmm. So I, I think this is pretty much where I stop. You can, you can. These are the main conclusions that I have talked about for the liquid state, the jamming uh, process, as well as the jam state with no uh, uh, two neighbors. And uh, so the general conclusion is that liquid and jam states in passive effective matter are uh, qualitatively different from what you have in passive systems. And, uh, it would be nice. I mean, we'll, so far, what I've talked about, uh, except for the small uh, tau p limit, are all uh, simulation results. So we are trying to develop some kind of uh, analytic understanding of what is going on in the systems. OK, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Uh, questions during the talk, or there? Yes. Uh, it, it, uh, I expect it to be different, uh, but we have not looked at it. But uh, there is something that I forgot to mention. Uh, this liquid state from which you are actually quenching has this long velocity correlations. It also has uh, this long uh, force force correlation. So if you just do an instantaneous quench to a low value of f, system gets jammed. 
the gram state also will have some special correlation of the active forces in the particle because such correlations are present in the liquid state. And this boils down to what you're saying that whether pull it slowly or pull it fast, if you pull it fast uh, instantaneous squares, then those correlations are basically uh, quenched in, in the jam state that we are looking at. And uh, that uh, somehow I think makes the jam state quite different from the jam state that we have in classics. Good. Question. One is the liquid jam state that you found in the infinite surface and time persists in one dimension. And the second question is mm -hmm. what happens if I now go to higher dimension, but the forces are only in the plus minus Okay. But you are still talking about the infinite persistence time limit, but the forces once you have chosen, whether it's plus or minus, then it doesn't change the function of time. I don't know. I have not. Uh, I think in one dimension it will jam. Whether one would have a liquid is uh, something that you know, I cannot say. Often. <clears throat> and uh, higher dimension where you have uh, uh, forces only in the, let's say, plus minus x reactions. Something that you can look at, but yeah, not venturing this in this one. I'm supposing there's some kind of connection or similar homology to influence shears. I mean, is there any numbers that's similar or obvious? So, I mean, the, some qualitative similarity is there. But if you take a jammed uh, uh, system, a passive jam system, apply shear, then that can fluidize uh, the, the, the system. Uh, so it's sort of similar to what we are talking about, where the, the forcing is not at the boundaries, but at the in, individual particles. So there is some similarity in the phenomenology, but uh, there are also big differences because when you shear, there is a direction that is chosen. So the shear plane and uh, the shear direction, the behavior will be somewhat different. Whereas here, everything is isotropic because the forces that you are giving to the particles, they are chosen all at random. Uh, <clears throat> now. Of course, I mean, you know, some of these things perhaps will, will go through, like, you know, you share it, go to the fluidized state, then there will be velocity. Uh, correlations, I am not so sure. I mean, how the special correlations to the velocity look like when you look at a sheared uh, a liquid state, which is generated from an amorphous state by a pipe shear. I mean, I think maybe Mike knows, I don't know. Maybe I'm not remembering that, but I thought there was some work by Elizabeth Agaritsis mm -hmm. and some of the other scientists in London. But I thought in intervention, they made some kind of connection. They made between, uh, Yes. I don't, I don't remember what the other is, mm -hmm. but someone just listened to that or something. Right, right. There was, there was a PNS paper, but the model that they looked at is not quite the same as. The active force model. So basically, they introduced this activity in a way which is somewhat different. And actually, in the, in the paper itself, it says that you want to actually analyze what happens in this situation where you apply uh, some forces uh, with some statistics uh, that they cannot analyze so far. Uh, 